In, in Jamaica growing up, music uh, was always a significant part of my life. Uh, there was, of course, music on the radio. Um, I remember the radio stations back there, RJR and JBC. Um, they used to play fantastic music. Um, I remember music, for example, like Millie Small, when that came out. When that came out with, uh, with my boy Lollipop, I so remember it uh, when that came out. So music was always there for, for me. Um, but the main place that I experienced music was, was in the church. In the Pentecostal church um, where I was, it was tambourine. We played our tambourine and it's, oh my gosh, it's sweet. That sort of rhythm that came from hearing the tambourine playing uh, whilst the, the congregation was clapping their hands, but it wasn't just a one, three rhythm that you get in a lot of European churches. It was two, four. And um, just to explain that, you got one, two, three, four. Um, in uh, predominantly white churches, it's they, they clap on the one and three. So it's one, three, one, three. But in our churches, it was one, two, three, four. There's just a bigger feel to it, man. Our parents couldn't go. Some of them, they weren't all Pentecostal mm. when they came to England. Mm. From back home, they were Methodists and all these kings. And that mm. courtesy of the scriptures, you came to your home and your home received you not. So a lot of them couldn't um, mm, worship. worship in the what they call the nominal churches at the time. So they had to find school halls. So obviously you couldn't have pianos in school halls mm. because they didn't have them. So that gave rise to portable instruments. And it wasn't a case of being taught these songs through um, the written medium of like traditional Western notation. It was all by rote, it was all by ear. And what you got from that was feel. You got the emotional background that came with that. You know, you, you, you got that um, essence behind the groan, you got the, the, the reason behind the moan that went along with what is called melismatic singing, you know, not just straight uh, singing, the melisma that comes from experience. The program was what was the instrument that was used uh, to, uh, to, to make money, basically, to, to, to get people. <laughs> That's how churches were built, uh, by collecting money, whether going to the pub or whatever, or in the church, having a, putting on a program. They call them concerts now, I think. They'd come in and then they'd boost. So it would be like, you know, 10, you know, 10 pence this person to sing, five pence that person don't sing, one pound don't say nothing, sit down. You know, and the night would string out and all, the, and all of the items you couldn't get through because of this kind of, you know, bidding backward and forward. I went up, I sang. The musicians did what they, I realised, they always do uh, or did in that church, which is, you raise a song, they'll pick you up, right? Everybody, the whole band. And so before I knew it, the, the band was playing along with me singing. I sang all three verses, closed the book, went to sit down. My goodness, the place erupted in a pro. Encore, encore. I think I was anchored three or four times that night, singing 106 from the Battle Hymns. And uh, they made a lot of money. From that day, two and a half days into my stay, or two days into my stay in England, I was Joe Aldred the singer. I remember um, Les Bernese as a drummer, you know, I remember his black kicks, and he would have what seemed like a million toms, you know, going around it, but that was just his kit. Fast forward, I was about the age of 12, and we had a drummer in the church, but he was played like marching kind of drumming thing, and behold, man. And I think he was a bus driver at the time, so he went to work. And um, Wayne said to me, just play. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, so he showed me a little beat, and he said, do you think you could do that? I said, I don't know, this was just before church. So um, he showed me and I did it and it felt right. There was something about it and he was saying, do it again and I did it again. I thought it was fluke and I did it again. Then he showed me something else and I did it again. Then church started. So I just sat in church and he said, no, you got to come. 
<laughs> so I had to go up and play in church right there, right then. And the rest is history. So one Christmas, my dad bought me this bass. To this day, I don't know what the bass was called because it had no name. It was a mess, but it was an electric bass and it was mine and I played it. It was an embarrassing bass because the guy that owned it, it was a red bass, but he painted it black. How do I know that? Because you could see the, it weren't, it used got gloss paint, so you could see the whole red paint underneath, this black gloss that he used to paint. So imagine in concerts now, I'm like 12 playing in concert with this ugly looking bass. But people are like, hmm, I'm so not right though. I'm so not right. I would class church as our musical university because we, we weren't, a lot of us weren't officially taught. We were self-taught, but yet we could play to a standard to some of those guys that have been to uni and played music, uh, but they didn't have the feel that we had. All those presentation opportunities, singing mm. at programs, singing on Sundays, we were quite, uh, au fait, we were confident, quite confident in front of people as a consequence, which forever will be my big fist up to, to church. It gave me the presentation skills for the rest of my life. And what I've realised is that the school side of things, I don't think that many teachers were expecting us to have the skills that we had and to have the confidence that we had. So whether you... Away. Yeah, whether you wanted to go to church or not, church actually upskilled us. It was the extracurricular. 100%. Each of us are comfortable as well in terms of presenting, because mm. it gives you that confidence yeah. mm. to yeah. present, to be able to mm. project um, your voice as well. And we look mm. back at many of the people that we've sung with, that we grew up with and we sung with, each of them are in management roles, presenting, mm. managing, coordinating. Mm. And some of these skills come from, uh, and disciplines, mm. not that I was very disciplined, <laughs> so I struggled in management. <laughs> but... <laughs> 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 I won't say no more. No, no. You couldn't add lib your way onto that. Yet. I did run a few lyrics, I must admit. I must admit. Did win the crowd over. I remember the first time my dad said, OK, I'm going to buy you an electric guitar. And I said, yeah, I want a Fender, Dad. And um, i never forget the first thing he said to me, Fender, Fender is something we'll go punk your. What, what do you mean, Fender? <laughs> I said, no, no, Dad, it's a Fender Strat. I want a Strat. And he said, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. So we went to the shop, um, Jones and Crossens, it was called in town. And um, he walked into the shop and I said, those are the Fenders there. I had a whole row of them queued up on stands. And he went over, looked at the ticket, £370, and he just walked straight back out of the shop. <laughs> and I thought, that was it. I thought that was my chance, finished. And funnily enough, a week later, he took me back to the shop and, um, and said, I'm gonna get the guitar. I was like, you're gonna get me a Fender. This was in the 70s. And um, it was 360 pounds in the 70s, um, which was like, I worked it out now that I didn't know at the time, but it was like a month's salary at the time. Um, this is a working class family, we weren't rich. My dad worked at um, Leyland at the time. And um, he saw something enough in me to commit that type of money um, to get me that guitar. I've still got the guitar to this day, I'll never get rid of it. Um, but he went into that shop and I remember the guy said, it's 360 pounds and my dad said, typical Jamaican, I'm not paying that for it. I got 300 cash and the guy said, sorry sir, they're 360 pounds. He goes, I got cash. And the guy said, I'm sorry. He said, I can't do it, 300, 300 pounds is not enough. And my dad picked up the money and I was tugging at his coat going, dad, dad, please don't, don't walk out. And he was going, shh, shh, shh. And he picked up the money, put it in his breast pocket. By the time we got to the door, I heard the guy go, sir, sir, hold on a sec. Let me speak to my manager. <laughs> and he went back, spoke to the manager. He goes, I think we can do it for 300 pounds. And my dad said, see, cash talk. <laughs> and he got the guitar. And he said to the guy, as they used to do, they put in a cardboard box and the guy said, 
Um, there you go. And he goes, nah, this needs a case. And the guy goes, well, the cases are like 60 pounds. He goes, needs a case. 60 pounds? He goes, no, 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 I need the case. Really? For 300 pounds? <laughs> I was going, oh no. In the end, long story short, my dad got the case and the guitar for 300 pounds. <laughs> and he walked out of the shop and he said to me, you see how things I don't know? That's how you bargain, cash talk. Don't want to say nothing, but make the cash talk. <laughs> and I learned a lesson from my dad that day, that you never buy anything at full price.